I'm going back to go forward. And I appreciate everything that you're saying about the community, which is which is really a big part of what we want to get at. But I want you to fill in the blanks. You are, you know, you're a club promoter. You're pragmatic. Uh, you discover Dr. Dre um, and you put together a group. You start getting on tours. You actually got a record deal um, and all of these other things. So let me know when it got uh, crazy, like, I can't believe this is happening. And then let me know when it got scary, like you started drawing attention from elements that knew that you were making money and some of the things that happened in the entertainment business. Fill that in for me. Like, wow, this is when this is really getting real. We, we, we realized that it was, it was crazy for us, man. It, it was interesting. When we went to Dallas, Texas one day, and we were, doing, we were playing in Texas, we got there a day early, and we were just walking through the mall like we do because, you know, see what they got different they don't have in L.A. Right, right. And we looked back, and it was like 10 people following us. And look back a few minutes later, it was like 20, 30 people following us. Like 50 people following us. Like, what the hell is going on? We got a whole mob following us, man. Wow. Like, what's going on? We, were, we might want to get up. We had to run like the Beatles, man. <laughs> and security had to put us into a, a closed store, and people was trying to get in. We didn't know whether they were mad or what, but it was the wrecking crew within town, and they wanted to get at us for a good reason. And I'm like, Damn. We didn't know we we were bigger. We've always been bigger outside of Los Angeles. Mm, sure. We've always been bigger outside of Los Angeles. And when you go when you went down south back then, because they had no one at that time, you just I mean your 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 whole persona just magnified a thousand times. So that situation was crazy. Um, we had I've I've had people offer me all kind of crazy ass deals. Is you know it it has its ups and downs and ebbs and flows, and I think when um when I was at Macola, right, and that's the that's the label that d distributed you, right? Huh? That's the label that distributed you, right, Macola? Yeah, Macola was our distributor, right. and uh, he had, he had made a new deal with some some new partners, right. and um they wanted a piece of my record, turn off the lights, and we we did a deal, we started doing a deal, but the deal wasn't right, and I didn't sign the contract. And um, they still gave me the check, but I hadn't signed the contract yet. Right. And uh, I did a licensing deal prior to while I was waiting for them to get me a new contract. And I'm like, why am I missing money? Because why am I missing money if we ain't got a deal yet? If y'all don't do the deal, I'm just missing money for no reason. And it, it wasn't an exclusive deal. It just was a, a licensing deal. And man, shoot, uh, I got a phone call in one, one night that, that scared, changed my life. Uh, one morning, I'm sorry, one morning, uh, six o'clock in the morning, LA time, I get a phone call and real raspy voice. Yes, Alonzo Williams. Uh, yes, can I help you? Yes, my name is so and so. I'm from uh, he's back east. I'm gonna say it like that. And uh, I understand uh, we've given you some money for your project and you sold it to someone else. And I just want to let you know if you were here in, in back east. That people like you end up in the in the uh, in the in the river or something like that. Wow, <laughs> good fellas, brother, good fellas. I appreciate that business, those business practices on the uh, and our this side of the country. And I stood up. Wait, hold on. I'm saying, wait a minute. What are you talking about? He explained to me what happened. I explained to him. I said, "Can I can I have a can I have the floor for a minute, sir? I'm I'm really being respectful. I don't want to miss no misunderstandings." I said, "Look." The person you that you are doing the business, I explained to him I couldn't sign this contract. I explained to him I didn't want to check. He told me to keep the check anyway. Okay? I told him I was going to do this deal. And for you to come at me like this right here, I said, I'm, I'm, feel, I'm threatened for no reason. I didn't do anything. I said, you know your man. And he did. I said, you know how your man is. And I says, it's real hard to get a word in edgewise when he gets on a roll. And I've been trying to explain this to him forever. And the dude apologized, man. He apologized. But I still was scared as hell. I still was scared. And from that point on, I made the point, when I go to Macola, I'm carrying my pistol with me. Okay? Because the bullets start flying, they're going to they're gonna be going both ways. Now, I'm not, I, I never claim to be a gangster. I ain't know what I do. But I'm like, any man, self-preservation is always on high on my priority list. Okay? 
And that was one of the things I had to deal with. And this, and we're not talking about, we're not talking about some local cats. We're talking about some guys who some real, some real soprano type dudes. Okay. Now I don't, I don't know if I would. I'm not trying to claim claim badass. That ain't what I'm doing. I'm just saying, as a man with 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 the thoughts of self preservation on his mind, the first thing came to me was always when you go to Macola, always be ready to go for it to go down. Right. Wow. That's now, amazing. None of these stories can Dre or anybody tell me they were gone by now. Okay. Right. Sure. And I think one of the things that I suffer from is that we did not come up together. They they were they're a lot younger than I am. Dre, Ice Cube too. Ice Cube, you put on, you helped him get his first single deal, right? Ice Cube was like sixteen when I, fifteen or sixteen when he came to me. He was like fifteen or sixteen. So if I'm fifteen, I'm if he's fifteen, I'm twenty seven. Okay, so when I when I got Eve after dark at twenty two, he's twelve. Ten. I'm sorry, he's ten. So they don't know the Lonzo that was out in the streets doing mobile parties, doing pick parties in the pit picnics in the park. They don't know that Lonzo. They know the Lonzo that was the baller with the big house that, you know, they could come to the club and go to the party, go to do those. They don't know the Lonzo. They don't know the grind king. Okay. They don't know the king of the grind. They don't know nothing about that right there. So because they weren't a part of that. They saw the record grind. They saw the, uh, the, the, the um, some of the club grind, but never saw, the the the, um, the roots of what made this thing cr- crack, and they never really dealt with Uncle Jam's army like that. I mean, me and Roger went back um, to 1970, 60, 77 together, and they don't know the transition from from uh, disco construction to Wrecking Crew. They don't know the transition from Unique Dreams Entertainment to to uh, um, Uncle Jam's army. All they know is Uncle Jam's army and Wrecking Crew. What's interesting is there's this connection, Lonzo, between, first of all, there's more than 10 years of history before NWA ever exists. There's, you know, what you're doing, clubs, uh, uh, putting out songs. You've got a relationship with, with, with Greg Mack at 1580K Day. You've got the relationship with Jerry Heller, which helped Easy connect the dots. But what's interesting, too, is in terms of this genre transition, you went from Disco Lonzo to this other thing. And so Disco was transitioning away at this time when you get going. And in fact, I guess we don't need to look any further than even the record Good Times by Sheik, which was produced by Nile Rodgers, who was a disco king. That's what was used to do Rapper's Delight. You know what I mean? There's this transition going on. That you are actually kind of, it's almost like you got one foot on one side of the bridge and another foot on the other side of the bridge. That's what I'm trying to say. I've been on the I've been walking on both sides of the bridge for the last 40 years, 50 years. Okay. When the when the when the rec, when the, when the, when the transition came out, when hit when I first started playing records, it was all disco. Donald Summers, BGs, or then and some and some R and B. Okay. Some a little R and B. Now all of a sudden, then funk come into the play. You got cameo, part of me funkadelic, um, slave. All oh, they come into play. This this is this is the height of my DJ career out in the streets. So I'm playing. I'm I'm juggling all these different sounds at one time. And then of course she comes into play again with rappers of light. It's 1979, and I'm playing that at Eve After Dark, and that's the bomb. And then all of a sudden. But Sheik ain't got to, Sheik ain't playing singing. Ain't no girls on this one right here. It's all three guys. I'm like, damn. So any when you when you look back, and I tell people, I have as as a person, I've experienced the Motown era. I grew up in Motown. I grew up on Philly, Philly International. I grew up on the dramatics. I grew up on on Smokey and Temptation and Intruders. I grew up on that. So when I hear the samples that these guys are grabbing or recreating to make this, I know where it came from the first time. So, and then when you, then when you are moving a music lover, you're not limited to just R and B. You, you like some blue eyed soul. Okay. The Doobie brothers, um, uh, Hall and Oates, all these people are part of my musical format as a DJ, because I'm playing not only for black folks and because even then black folks was into that too. 
If there was a radio station we had in L.A. called two of them. One was called Q102 and one was called K-Ace. You didn't know what was going to come up on the turntable. 103.9 K-Ace. Yep. 103 point in the case. You didn't know what was, you, you had no idea what was going to be played. All you knew was going to be good, though. Okay? <laughs> and that was my musical foundation. And then, but music, music is still is still is still evolving as we kept playing. When I first when I got into the game, you could not. I couldn't have gotten into the. I, I couldn't afford to get into the music game on a standard level. What I mean by that is, if I had to hire drummers, guitar players, bass players, horn players to do my music, I probably couldn't afford to do it because it took money. It took time to do that. You had to practice that stuff, but when the digital age hit, you can hire one guy with a bunch of keyboards and a sequencer and play all that stuff together. And now I can go to the studio and make a song in a matter of minutes, pay one guy. Okay. Yeah. And it just made that, that whole process, the digital era made, made it, uh, made, made it able, made it able for me to be in the game. It brought the cost of mu- making, it brought the cost of music down and because I wasn't totally broke, even though it's not as cheap as it is right now, it made it affordable.